Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We're currently studying the book of John. Turn if you would to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Verse 9. Wait a second. Some people traded spots here. Preacher gets used to seeing people in specific spots. <laughs> Verse 9 says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this evening. And God, you know how desperately I needed to help. Last week was comical in places, not because I was telling jokes, but because it just was. And so, Lord, we just pray for your help, for your guidance, for your direction. We're glad that you're here with us. We pray that you would lead and direct and that you'd um, stop any evil influence from having any um, ability to interrupt or to, to block anybody from learning. Lord, we just praise you for all that you do. We thank you for the safe trip that we had today. And um, with no issues, we thank you for the safe trip that Brian had and that they uh, got up there and back a lot of miles in a short number of days, Lord. And we just thank you for your hand of protection. But once again, we ask for your guidance tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, if you guys remember last week, I'd taken an antihistamine just a few hours before the service. <laughs> it certainly had an impact. Uh, I went back and listened to it. There was one point where I was arguing with myself. I guess the one good thing about arguing with yourself is you're going to win the argument. <laughs> but the bad side is, is you lose the argument, Unless too. you have to a standstill. Well, yeah, you might have to come to a standstill. Amen. <laughs> but I think all in all, it turned out okay, considering my mind was in a fog. And, and uh, even though we had a little bit of a, I had a little bit of an argument with myself, the, the antihistamines didn't prevent the word of God from being preached or from truth coming out of it. So we were looking at the fact that the Samaritans were a half-breed group of people who were half Jewish and half Gentile. And tonight we're actually going to kind of delve into some, and I know it's not politically correct, but we're going to dive into some racism issues. Um, we're not going to do it right away, but hopefully before the message is over, we'll get that far. So the first text we looked at showed how the area of Samaria, Samaria which had been occupied the Jews, had been conquered, and the conquering forces displaced the Jews, took, kicked them out of there, and they put in a whole bunch of other nationalities, and, um, which led to ultimately, over the course of time, the mixing of Jews and other nationalities, which God forbid. God didn't want the Jews mixing with anybody. He told them, if you mix with them, you're going to start worshiping their gods. And listen, if you study your Bible a lot, and there's a lot of people who don't know this, but it's still a biblical truth. If you study the Bible a lot, this battle between Satan and God started with the dividing of this earth. Well, it actually started before this earth was even correct, created, but I believe that they sat down, and this is my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt. I believe they sat down and they agreed to some rules of engagement, if you will. And what they did, now this is biblical, what they did is they split the earth into 12 different parts, 12 different nations. And God gave Satan 11 of the 12, and he kept Israel for himself. And it says in the Bible, I didn't keep Israel because they were the mightiest, the smartest, the best, or anything like that. But to the contrary, I kept them because they were the least. Amen. Because, see, he's going to beat Satan with the weakest team, if you will. Now, with that being said, God then chose Israel for his people and he blessed them. And he gave them understanding beyond what we can understand. I mean, if you stop and look historically, 
Some of the best scientists this world has ever seen were Jews. Some of the um, um, best military strategists that this world has ever seen were Jews. And you can go right on down the list. If you look at just the ingenious of invention, do you know how many inventions that we enjoy today came from Jews? <laughs> God blessed them. He gave them understanding in some things. And, and um, But there was a caveat with all of God's blessing, and one of those caveats was don't join up with those other nations. Those other nations have different gods. I imagine 11 of them. Those other nations have different gods. And if you intermingle with them, if you marry their daughters, their daughters are going to convince you to serve those gods. Don't do it. Don't do it. And, and this is going to get me in trouble, but a biblical truth is shown here, and that is the woman can lead the man down the wrong path. It's just a biblical fact. But eventually the Jews came back to the land of Samaria and they started intermarrying with these different nations that were put in their, in their place. Uh, so in, in essence, the Jews were willing to share the land, which was against God's commandment. When they came back, they should have come back with God on their side with the intent of displacing those nations that were brought in and taking the land back from themselves. To this day, you see things in nature over that land of Israel. Yes. God made specific promises of that land. And in those specific promises, he also um, made consequences for anybody that gets in the way of those promises. Uh, there's a book out that's called, and I always get it wrong, Lisa always corrects me, but it's something like, So As We've Done Into Israel, or something, the title yes. something yeah. to that uh, that flavor, I guess, or that, those yes, words, we as we have done unto Israel. And what that does is it goes in and it shows that almost every major disaster that's happened in America came right after a president forced Israel to give up some of their land for peace. That's not America's land to get involved with. No. It's not America's uh, position to get involved with anything between God and Israel. The only thing that America should do with Israel is support everything they want to do. <laughs> That's what we should do because the Lord said, I will bless those that bless thee and I'll curse those that curse thee. So after we looked at these, this whole thing of the half-breed Samaritans, we went on to Acts chapter 8 uh, and examined the fact that the Samaritans did not receive the Holy Ghost simply by believing. Every other example in Scripture, as soon as somebody believed and accepted the free gifts from Jesus, they got the Holy Ghost, but these Samaritans didn't. And it's the only place in the Bible, and it causes a lot of, uh, of uh, I'm trying to think of a better word, I'm thinking consternation, but it causes a lot of, I guess, anguish would be a good word, between, the, um, between people who don't understand why that would take place. So we talked about it a little bit to show why uh, the Samaritans had to have the apostles lay hands on them prior to them receiving the Holy Ghost. And, and today we're going to continue exploring those thoughts. We're not done with that yet. We also took a look at Luke chapter 10, verse 33. You don't have to turn there. That's the historical account of the Good Samaritan. And we talked about how the law looked at him and didn't have anything for him and passed on the other side of the street. Religion looked at him and didn't want anything to do with him and they passed on the other side of the street. And a good Samaritan, there's a reason why God told that historical account. The Samaritan had it right. And the Jews were prejudiced against the Samaritans in a major way. And um, they thought they were, their prejudice was godly founded as of many people with prejudice today feel like their prejudice is godly founded. And, um, but they think that their prejudice is godly found. And I, I remember when I was serving in the military, before I even became a Christian, uh, I was stationed with a guy that was from down south. And uh, I got saved, and I started talking to him about the Bible. He didn't want to hear nothing about the Bible. And um, he said, you know, some of the most racist ideas that ever hit this earth come right out of that Bible. Well, they come out of that Bible if you don't 
look at the context. If you don't look at, God is no respecter of persons. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, a, a Greek, a African, an American, even an American can get saved if you can believe that or not. Praise oh. God. And so, uh, yeah, amen, praise God on that one. So the Bible just has this way of cutting through all of humanity's garbage, through all the humanism, through all the nonsense, cuts right through it and gets to the point of the matter. Amen? Amen. And that's something I love about this book. Now, it's true. Um, a preacher can make this book pretty much say anything he wanted to say. I've told you before that one of the, when I was going through seminary, one of the um, homiletic classes, which homiletics is the art of preaching, it's also called hermeneutics, but in one of the classes we were given a false doctrine and we had to preach a message of that false doctrine and we had to use Bible to back it up. We couldn't just get up and expound upon a false doctrine. We had to use Bible to back it up. And there was a method to the professor's madness and the method was to show you that you're handling a very dangerous book, and it is dangerous. One of my favorite preachers always said that this book's a, a time bomb. It's a time bomb, and it can go off at any minute. And um, you need to approach this book with reverence. Because if you want to believe a lie, God's going to show you verses that will help you believe a lie. If you want to believe one. But if you want to seek out truth, God will show you absolute truth. And how do you know the stuff that you can pull out of there that's false from the stuff that's real. Well, first step is context. Amen. Um, context, a text without a context is a pretext. Yep. That's what my English teacher always told me. And so you got to look at the context of, of what it is that's being said. So even when I preach, sometimes I use one verse. You should go back because I give you copies of those verses, at least for the Sunday um, lesson. Um, you should go back and look at those verses and make sure that I'm given to them to you in context. Amen? Amen. Another way is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. There are so many churches that will take one verse out of the Bible and build a doctrine off of one verse. Yeah. I'm telling you that you shouldn't build a doctrine unless you can find at least three verses that back up that doctrine that you're trying to, to demonstrate. So, the Bible cuts right through the chase. And um, we're not going to study this in detail right now. We'll, we'll get to it when we get to it, but you're in John chapter uh, 4. Look at verse um, 22. It says, you worship, you know, he's still talking to the woman at the well. And he says to her, you worship what you know not. What? Excuse me, let me start again because I worried wrong. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Salvation comes from the Jews. Salvation, you say, where does salvation come from today? The Jews. If, if you're going to get saved, you have to put your trust in a Jewish Messiah. <laughs> and, and you have to do what that Jewish Messiah said you needed to do in order to be saved. Amen. And then the Bible, the, you know the entire Bible came from Jews? I said that once and a guy wanted to argue with me saying that, what about Dr. Luke? You know what Dr. Luke was? He was a Jew. The oracles of God came from the Jews. Every word in this book was written by a Jew. God chose the Jews to write it. And you say, why would he choose the Jews and nobody but the Jews? Okay, let's take a step backwards to what I was talking about earlier. God divided the world into 12 parts. He took Israel, gave the rest of the world. I shouldn't say gave it to him because he didn't. And now... With the New Testament, he's made a provision for everyone, no matter what nation they're in, to get saved. Yes. But that way is straight and narrow. It's the, it's the door. You have to go through the door. The door is Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter. It does not matter how good a person you are. You're not good enough. Doesn't matter how good your intentions are. You can have the best intentions uh, and, and you can be the most sincere person in the world and be sincerely wrong. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. So Amen. salvation comes from the Jews, but when we read the passage, do you take time to realize that John, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, overthrows three of the world's major religions in one swat? <laughs> And actually more than three, but I'm just talking about three of the major religions. With that one statement, 
Salvation is of the Jews. You can say goodbye to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. You can say goodbye to Islam or Mohammedism. You know, it wasn't until recently that they started calling it Islam. Historically, they called them Mohammedans. Yeah. And, uh, but you can say goodbye to them. They, uh, Lisa was talking to me about an article that she read this week that was written by a Muslim that wanted to, he, he's, he's in the ecumenical frame of mind and he's trying to bring all the Christians into the fold. And this guy was saying, we believe in Jesus. What they believe is they believe that Jesus was a man who physically walked the face of the earth at one point in time. And they'd say, go as far as to say he was a good teacher. But they deny that he's God Almighty. Amen. That's right. They say God has no son. And they say anybody that believes that God has a son should be put to death. Well, God has a son and God is the son and God was the son and God is the Holy Ghost and it's something that blows your mind. Amen. I love a complex God. If, if I could understand everything about him, he'd be limited to my simple-minded intellect. But he's far more complex, amen, mm -hmm. than what we can think about. So goodbye Buddhism, goodbye Islam, and goodbye Hinduism. Goodbye. Three of the major religions in the world. Bye-bye. Now, and that's being gracious because you could take most of the, Christ, the churches that say they're Christian churches and say bye-bye to them too. You know, uh, there's a church that I talk about frequently. I'm going to give you guys a chance to tell me what church you think that is. Catholicism. Catholicism. <laughs> They're Jew haters. Salvations of the Jews. Why would you hate where your salvation comes from? Well, first of all, I don't think most Catholics are saved. And I don't think most Catholics are Christians. Because being a Christian, listen, being born into a religious family no more makes you a Christian than being born in a hospital makes you a doctor. Amen? Amen. And so a Christ, becoming a Christian is a personal choice that you make when you realize that you're a sinner and that there's nothing you can do about your sin that's already happened and you need a Savior. And that Savior comes in the form of a Jewish Messiah. Salvation is of the Jews. And so the Catholics historically and even to this day uh, I've heard of a celebrity recently who's a he was a devout Roman Catholic um, making reference to the Christ haters speaking of the Jews the Christ killers the Christ killers the Jews didn't kill Christ who killed Christ amen usually that's a trick question usually when you say who, who killed Christ well it was the Romans no I killed Christ he had to die for my sins and so did you uh, we're all Christ killers if you want to look at it that way. Salvation doesn't come from an era. This message I told you is going to hit on racism, amen? Some people are going to be bad. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Arabs. I'm just saying salvation doesn't come from them. Salvation doesn't come from an Indian. As a matter of fact, it doesn't come from an Italian. It doesn't come from a German. And it doesn't come from an American. Salvation is of the Jews, Amen. Now, uh, the Bible is very clear that salvation is from the Jews. We read the verse. Salvation is of the Jews. And I realize there's a lot of people who are struggling with that statement. But it can't be much clearer. You worship, you know not what, verse 22. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And so, I realize that that, that, that statement flies in the face of those who who are trying to bring all religion factions together in unity. They hate statements like that. Because they want to give just as much credibility to a witch doctor and just as much credibility to a, a voodoo high priest, and just as much credibility to a Shaolin, just as much credibility to whatever you want to call it. And all of those paths are wrong paths. Amen. All paths don't really lead to the same place. Um, we live in Alamosa, Colorado, and if I say, uh, go to California, and you say, well, how do I get there? Doesn't matter. Anywhere you go will get you there. And you start heading east. You better be ready to swim miles and miles and miles of ocean because you're going to have to go across a couple oceans to get to California heading east. Amen? Amen. And so... Uh, 
salvation, there's one way, and, and that way is all roads do not lead to the same place. You're dying to say something. Don't do that to Rome. All, all roads lead to Rome. All roads, yeah. <laughs> and, and that might be true. All those other roads do lead to Rome, amen? You're never going to bring the world together in unity, at least not. There's going to be a fake unity that comes for a short period of time. When the Antichrist shows up, they're going to think that they've achieved unity. We finally got unity, and yet even in de a declaration of unity, they're admitting that unity doesn't exist because in that unity, they have to set about to capture and kill every Christian because they're not part of the unity. Well, guess what? If any faction's not part of the unity, then unity doesn't exist. <laughs> and so they're going to think they have unity, but they don't have unity at all. God's a God of division. He's not a God of unity. God sets things in motion and he puts things in place and he brings you to cross, put, uh, cross points in your life and he says, he sits back and he says, you've got a free will. Choose. What are you going to do? And there have been probably a lot of people who have listened on the internet who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and right now God's saying, you have been given enough information from this preacher. Choose. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And you reject him. And you've rejected him over and over and over again. How much long suffering do you expect him to have? He died for your sins. How long do you expect him to put up with your knucklehead nonsense? Because he has a limit to how much he'll put up with. And historically you can see that through the Bible. How he's overthrown nations. And you may say, when I say God's a God of division, you may say, preacher, you sure repeat that a lot. And I do. And there's a couple reasons why I repeat it a lot. The first reason why I repeat it a lot is because people don't understand that God is a God of division because right now it seems like the entire Christian world is telling everybody God wants us all to get together. And that's a half-truth, which Satan is a master at half-truths. Yep. God does want us all to get together, but he wants us to get together in perfection. He wants us to get together in pure, holy doctrine. He does not want us to compromise doctrine or the word of God or holiness just to say that we've gotten together. And so um, I say it because there's a lie that's being permeated out there and it's being repeated over and over and over and over again. And people are buying it. People who are professing Christians are buying it. They're gobbling it up. And it's a lie. So that's one reason why I repeat it over and over. There's another reason why I repeat it over and over and over. I repeat it over and over again because the best learning comes from repetition. Yes. And there's even a third reason why I repeat it over and over. The third reason is because it's true. Because it's true. God's a God of division. Even in the final judgment, it says he's going to divide the sheep nations from the goat nations. Amen? Amen. So, just making that statement puts you at a point of division. Just even making that one statement puts you right now, right this second, at a point of division. Are you going to accept the Bible for what it says? Or are you going to cling to what you've been taught regardless of what the Bible says? a good thing for you to ponder on for just a minute. You know me, I'm not in any rush, amen? Amen. The UN, the UN has it wrong. The UN, uh, the United Nations, which more appropriately has been coined by one of my favorite preachers, the usual nothing. <laughs> the usual nothing has it wrong. Every single religion that does not accept salvation from a crucified Jew who came to earth as God in the flesh yes. has it wrong. I don't care what the religion is. Narrow is a way that leads to salvation. During the law, you had to become a Jewish proselyte if you were a Gentile in order to be saved. Under grace of the New Testament, you must accept Jesus Christ, a Jew, as your Savior. 
Anything else fails, no matter how moral, how good, how sweet, how nice, how tolerant, etc. They may be. Uh, I, I saw a preacher, I, I don't know who he is uh, off the top of my head. I saw his picture, but I don't listen to a lot of preachers. But I saw uh, a picture of him with a quote under it that says, um, um, Hell is going to be filled with good people. Hell is going to be filled with baptized people. Hell is going to, he said a third thing too, but I don't recall what that is. And he said, Why? And he said, because none of those things bring you to salvation. It's Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross that brings you to a point of salvation. So if you're counting on your works, how good you can be, you're lost. You're destined for hell. If you're counting on your church, your religion, you're lost. You're heading for hell. If you're counting on baptism, you're lost. You're heading for hell. If you're counting on clean living, you're lost. You're heading for hell. Amen. If you're counting on the fact that you're better than so-and-so down the street, you're lost. You're headed for hell. There's only one way, folks. One way. And there's going to be a time when national salvation will be a reality. When Jesus reigns and rules on earth. Right now, there's no such thing as a Christian nation. There never has been. Some Christians, some professing Christians got really upset when President, then President Obama, um, who doesn't have to live by the rules that he thinks everybody else should have to live by. Uh, there was, there was a, um, a point in a speech where he said America is no longer a Christian nation. And there were some Christians who got upset by that. But I'm going to give you a news break. America was never a Christian nation. There's no such thing as national Christianism or Christianity. There's no such thing. Uh, Christianity in our dispensation that we live in is an individual by individual thing. And so there's Arabs that are saved, there's Russians that are saved, there's Ukrainians that are saved, there's Jews that are saved, there's even Baptists that are saved. I know that one's hard to believe. <laughs> but there's even some Baptists that are saved. There's Pentecostals that are saved. There's Mormons that are saved. There's Catholics that are saved. Now, we had one family that was on fire for this church, and I made a statement once that there's Mormons that are saved, and they never came back and said, I can't go to a church where the preacher says that Mormons are Christians. Did I say that Mormons are Christians? I said there are some Mormons that are saved. Because salvation is not predicated or denied based on what religion you call yourself. It's, to, it's decided based on whether you accept the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ as your payment for your sins. Amen. And if you've done that and you confess that Jesus is God, that he has the ability to cleanse you of your sins, and you believe in your heart that he rose again the third day, you're saved. And it doesn't matter if you're a Mormon, a Jew, a Gentile, a Greek, in Romans, it says the same God overall. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so there's no such thing as national salvation. We're going to look at a little bit of Bible. Look at Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 1 and look at verse uh, 31. You guys are getting a little disappointed. You're saying, man, we're halfway into this. And he hasn't had us turning all over in our Bible. But I'm got him. Luke chapter 1 and look at verse uh, 31. It says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So who is this talking about? Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's when you're going to see national salvation. Amen. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2. Look at verse 4. It 
says, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath more than seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and he lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. You can't do it on your own, folks. Verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. And so that's where you're going to start seeing some national uh, salvation. But when it does come, it will be through the Jewish capital of Israel. That's where he's going to set up his throne. The references that prove this entire chapter of the Bible so that we will not read them, but we will go, we'll provide them so you can look up for yourself. The, the, ver the, the verses that prove my statement beyond a shadow of a doubt would have to read the entire chapters to get it. So Psalm 1. You can write them down if you want to go back and read them. Psalm 1, Isaiah 2. Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. Joel chapter 3. People are saying, you're going way too fast, preacher. So one of you can holler out where you got the last one. Joel 3. He is the fast scribbler. And Zechariah 14. This kingdom will include a Jewish king from a tribe of Judah. Amen. Here's the verses for that. Genesis, or the chapter for that. Genesis chapter 49. 2 Samuel 7. And Psalm 110. This kingdom's going to come after a fake Christ. Yep. Shows up on the scene. Professing to be... God manifests in the flesh. Where do you get that? Well, you get it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 11. So this entire subject brings us to yet another bunny trail. And I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I'm, it's in the back of my mind right now because my mom always watches this. And I've been wiping my nose a lot. And she's going to send me a text and says, son, you need to trim your mustache. And mom, it's allergies. <laughs> So, at any rate, another bunny trail. Many people are perplexed by the Holy Scripture when it talks about uh, the first conversions of the Samaritans. They, they see a controversy there, and they're perplexed by it because, like I said, it's the only place in the entire Bible that it took the laying on of hands in order to receive the Holy Ghost. And um, they're perplexed by it. True Bible doctrine tells us that when we receive the Holy Ghost, we are baptized in the Holy Ghost the very instant we get saved. Yep. And I don't know about you, and, I, and it's different for different people. When I got saved, the very second I got saved, I felt euphoric. It felt like a million pounds were lifted off my back. I, I could feel those sins being taken away. Now, some people don't have that kind of experience. They just, they, they trust in their heart that God saved them, but they don't have any of that euphoria. They didn't necessarily feel a weight lift off of them. So I'm not trying to set a tone where you go, I didn't feel that, I must not be saved. <laughs> but if you're feeling that way, if you're saying, I must not be saved, well then get saved. There was a point in time when my kids were struggling off and on with whether they really meant it when they got saved. And then there was some times when they'd come to talk to me about it and I'd say, well, are you doubting it? They'd say, well, yeah, I am. And instead of me trying to convince them that they were saved, I'd say, well, why don't you get saved now? 
if if you're struggling with it and don't know that you're saved, you know your heart right now means business. Get saved right now. And don't sit there and argue with yourself about whether you meant it back then or you didn't mean it back then. Just get saved right now. Amen. There's a lot of Christians who are professing Christians who probably aren't really saved that the Holy Ghost lays on them. You're not really saved. You need to get saved. But they can go back to a point in time and say, well, fight the Holy Ghost on it. You know, I, I think I got saved back here. I'm not real sure, but I'm pretty sure that why do you want to play with your soul? That thought that you may not be saved may be coming from the Holy Ghost. Get saved. Get saved now. And you want to know what? If every time, let's say you're somebody that is just unstable in their salvation and you have that feeling frequently, eventually the devil's going to get tired of watching you make a profession of faith and he's going to leave you alone. <laughs> so if you have to do it a hundred times, do it a hundred times. Amen. Amen. So the minute you get saved, you're baptized with the Holy Ghost and you receive the Holy Ghost. But this wasn't initially the case, at least not for the Samaritans. So the Samaritans, they believed, they confessed, but they didn't get the Holy Ghost. Acts is a transitional book. You always need to remember when you're reading the book of Acts, it's a transitional book. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And um, I hope we can get through the topic of racism tonight. I don't know that we will. I'd like to because it's not a topic that I really enjoy or relish talking about. But um, Acts chapter 8, look at uh, verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaritans had received the word of God, that sounds like being saved, doesn't it? They sent unto them Peter and John. Now remember, Peter has the keys. And the keys doesn't mean that Peter decides who's saved and lost. The keys just mean he opens the door. And at Pentecost, he opened the doors to the Jews. And we're going to see that he's going to open the door to the Samaritans right now. And then yeah. I believe it's around Acts chapter 11 with uh, Cornelius, I believe it is, that he opens the doors to the Gentiles. And then the, all the doors are open. And God says, open the doors that no man can shut. Only God can shut those doors once they're opened. Amen. Amen. So back to verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles were which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All the things that we say are required for salvation, they believed on him, they trusted on him. Baptism is not part of salvation, but that's something you get after salvation. So they did everything you need to be saved and they even got baptized, but they didn't receive the Holy Ghost. Isn't that weird? This is the only place in the Bible that that happens. The only place. Verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands the apostles, uh, from the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. And I'm not going to go into that because that's a whole different subject. But Peter said, perish with your money. You can't buy the gifts of the Holy Ghost. can't be bought for money. So this issue, believe it or not, deals with the ecumenical movement and racial integration. That's what this issue is all about. The Samaritans are a group of people that didn't stay true to the Word of God. They intermarried when they shouldn't have intermarried. They became idol idolatrous. They were worshiping idols. They were uh, doing everything contrary to the Word of God. So let's look at some things. Look at 2 Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17, look at verse 24. Now you guys are gonna test my ability to pronounce these Bible words. 
2 Kings 17, verse 24. It says that the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sapravaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore, they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast moved and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore, he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Now, that goes back to the world being divided up into 12 things, and the land that God had is his land. Amen? Verse 27. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom he brought from thence. This should answer a question of Brian, because they're going to be returned. And let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the man of Babylon made Sukkoth Binoth, and the man of Kuth made Nergal, and the man of Hamath made Ashamah, and the Avites made Nibaz and Tarpek, and the Sepharvaim and the Sepharvites burnt their children in the fire to Adremelech and Anemelech, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. See that intermingling? The Jews came back. They brought priests back. And they feared the Lord, but they started serving all these other priests. Verse 34, and to this day, they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after the statutes or after their ordinances. See, it's Jews, their ordinances. Or after the law and commandment, which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So you can continue on if you want to read more, going all the way down to verse 41, but the Jews came back. When they displaced the Jews and brought in all these other nations, God said, that's my land. And he sent in lions. And the lions started killing people. And the people went to the king that sat in the other nations and said, hey, there's a God of this land and we're not following him. And so the king said, send some back in. And they sent them back in. And the Jews initially feared the Lord, but they started serving those other gods. They were trying to fit in. They were getting into that ecumenical movement. Amen? Amen. Now look at Ezra chapter 4. That's after 1 and 2 Chronicles. Then you have Ezra right after 1 and 2 Chronicles. Look at Ezra chapter 4. And look at verse 9. Says, then wrote Rahum the chancellor to Shimshay the scribe and the rest of their companions, the Denites, the Aphersite, Athersethites, <laughs> the Tarpolites, the Arphasites, the Archivites, the Babylonians, the Susanchites, the Dehavites, and the Elamites. Could any of you guys done better than that with those names? No? <laughs> and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Asnapper brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side of the river and at such a time. So they're getting ready to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it's Jews. 
And all those other nations are the other nations that were sent in there. Amen. Is that clearing it up for you some, brother? Mm -hmm. Look at Nehemiah, which is right after Ezra. Just go over one book. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4. Look at verse 2. Nehemiah 4, 2. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these people Jews... See, the Jews have gone back. What do these people Jews... Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? And you know what the answer to that question is? Yep, 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 yep. Amen. So you see there's racial tension between Israel and Samaria. There's racial tension there. And there's a significant history that goes that brought about that racial tension. It started with intermarrying and the result was these half-breed Jews. And he emphasizes the fact that the Jews were to remain pure and keep their, that bloodline pure. Look at Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. They're supposed to keep that bloodline pure. They're not supposed to intermarry. Look at uh, verse 25. It says, and I contended with them, and I cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair. <laughs> you think Nehemiah is trying to make a, what's the matter? Did I say something wrong? Oh, you're just saying, ouch, because of plucking off their hair? <laughs> and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourself. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Women are downfall. Can't live with them, can't live without them. Amen? I love women. I love women. My mama's a woman. My wife's a woman. I don't have any sisters, but if I did, I'm sure I would have picked on them. Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so God set bounds to the races, and it was has nothing to do with any race being superior. It's because of that battle between 12 different nations. 11 against 1. And it's always been like that. There's never been a group of people more persecuted than the Jews. I know that um, blacks in America would talk about their persecution. It's nothing compared to what the Jews have gone through. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making light of the stuff that the blacks historically in America have had to come, go through. I'm not making light of that at all. I'm just saying nobody has been persecuted like those Jews have. Mm -hmm. And it's because there's 12, there's 11 nations against one and God's going to win with that one nation so God set up those bounds and he doesn't want the races to intermingle and once again I always got to clarify that you know we got a, a dear couple that we love dearly Lisa led uh, the woman to um, Christ and it's an interracial marriage and I was talking about this with him and he said well I, I love my wife I'm not going to do anything I said whoa cap the bricks I'm not saying you should do anything mm -hmm. You've married her, love her, respect her, treat her good. <laughs> and, um, you know, God's perfect plan was that you didn't have an interracial marriage, but you do, and there's nothing that can be done about it. So what God has grown to, you know, put together, let no man put asunder. And um, uh, don't go beating yourself up and feeling all down in the mouth and feeling like you're second class. It's not the case. Amen? Amen. But God didn't want the races intermingling. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at verse 8. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance. See there, that's that 12 nations being divided. 
when the whole mind, when the Most High divided to the twelve nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, and he set bounds of the people according to the number of their children, of the children of Israel. So he set twelve nations, he set bounds around those twelve different nations. And it was his expectation that the people stayed within those bounds. But man has never done what God's wanted him to do, ever. And so now... Uh, the intermarrying of those different nations has been so prevalent. I mean, you even ask an American, you ask an American what their lineage is, they're not going to say I'm an American usually. They're going to say, well, I'm half German, half Russian, half Irish. You know, they're going to list about 12 halves that they are. Amen? And, and if you look at that, uh, what's those uh, DNA sites? I, I, I recommend you stay away from them, but I think there's a motive behind them wanting to get everybody's DNA, but but um, Ancestry.com and they have the commercials where the person says, man, I was always told I was a German. Come to find out I'm a Ukrainian. <laughs> Big whoop. You're you. Amen. And uh, so if there is an interracial couple married today, what should they do? Love each other. Treat each other decently. Uh, respect one another. What God joined together, let no man put us under. Amen? Amen. So it still didn't, that, even saying that, that doesn't change God's intentions. Many have used this truth, this truth about those 12 nations, they use as a means to cause prejudice, but this has nothing to do with prejudice. It has nothing to do with superiority. It has to do with a battle, a spiritual battle between God and Satan. And, um, and, and really the line's being crossed so much as I've already said um, there's absolutely nowhere in the Bible any inclination or any idea that one race is superior to another race with possibly the exception of Israel who is God's chosen people um, why, that's one of the reasons why they're hated so much you got an example of that when uh, uh, Jacob loved Joseph more than his other kids. What did the other kids do? All 11 of them, huh? 11 against one, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> All 11 of them, when Jacob, who was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he had one son that he loved the best, the 11 others hated him and wanted him killed. <laughs> huh, is there any parallel between that and the 12 nations? One's God's chosen people, and those 11 nations hate that one nation, and they want to obliterate it from the face of the earth. Is there any difference? Huh. I love this book. It's not, this truth is not a means for you to hate any race. As a matter of fact, if anything, you should love all the races and do everything you can to get every one of them saved. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let's just reverse those numbers and go to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. Look at verse 3. Um, let's start with verse 1 so we can get context. I don't want to just jump in in the middle of something. It says, He that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to his tenth generation shall he not enter unto the congregation of the Lord an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to the tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pithor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. And so, as I said, people will, 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 will pull these little verses out, and they'll use it as a justification for their own personal prejudice, which is not the case. It's not the case. So some folks are saying already, I don't like what you're saying tonight, preacher. I'm never going to tune in again. Well, if you don't like truth, don't tune in. If you do like truth, keep coming back. You're going to learn some things. 
But if you have a, 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 a if you're repelled by what's being say, it said, I'm going to tell you your issues with God and not with me. Because I'm showing you stuff right out of the Bible. The simple truth is that the Holy Bible, God's holy and true word for bed, intermarrying, integration, ecumenicalism, I probably said that word wrong, but I don't care. <laughs> for an entire nation of Israel as a theocracy. People think when God comes back, it's going to be a monarchy because they call him king, but it's not a monarchy. It's a theocracy. It's the world answering to God. Amen? Amen. So a government with God as king, and we don't have time to go into all of that. I don't guess we're completely through with racism yet. We'll have to continue with racism next week, but we'll start off next week talking about a government with God as king. And remember, we're, we're on a bunny trail right now. This really, um, I'm not going to say it has nothing to do with the book of John because it certainly does. It explains some of the stuff that's going on there in John chapter 4 with that woman of Samaria. And um, when I said she had a curt attitude towards God, I was getting this from the, from the crowd. Yeah, he, she's, you know, you can just see the animosity in her voice that there's no dealings with the, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Well, there's a reason behind all of that. Amen? Amen? And so we'll finish that thought next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. And even though sometimes it goes against our grain, I think it's designed that way. Our ways are not your ways. And the only way for our ways to line up with your ways is for us to yield when your word goes against our grain. So, Lord, I pray for your help in doing just that. I pray that you'd help us to conform to your word, not to be racist or prejudiced or anything like that, Lord, but to understand that there is a battle. And that battle is still raging today, the spiritual battle over those 11 nations against one. God, you're going to rise up out of that thing, the victor. Bless and Lord, I'm so grateful that with all that going on, all that spiritual battle going on, you said, you know what? I'm going to save everybody I can out of those 11 nations. Amen. I'm going to love them. I'm going to provide a way for them to spend eternity with me and leave their nation and come to the perfect nation that will be ruled by me. No corruption. No injustice. Lord, thank you. Thank you for my salvation, Lord. I certainly didn't deserve it, but I'm grateful for it. We praise you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.